Welcome and thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. I am James, this is Aid, and we are working on the book of 1 Samuel. We're up to, uh, in the grand scheme of our studies, up to episode 216, but we're nearing the end of uh, 1 Samuel. Mm -hmm. And we're in 1 Samuel 22. Remember the structure of Samuel is, first of all, it's the first half is Samuel the prophet, then it is Saul's kingdom, and then when we get into 2 Samuel, that's actually the life of, of David as king. Mm -hmm. So in the later portions of 1 Samuel, we're primarily in the Saul narrative and David is essentially running for his life. Mm -hmm. So anything to add before we get started here today? Mm -mm. No? Okay. So make sure to read through your copy of 1 Samuel 22 at home. And here is my summary. David left Gath, which is a Philistine city. And he fled to the cave of uh, Adullam, or Adullam, however you want to pronounce that. It's a famous place at the time in Judah. Some Israelites, including his own brothers, found out about it and came and supported him. All the discontented of Israel, were told, actually gathered and rallied around David, which amounted to about 400 soldiers. David went to the city of Mitzpah to the king of Moab and asked for the, the king for protection for his parents' until the Lord revealed to him what he was supposed to do next. The prophet Gad, however, told David not to stay there, but to flee to the forest of Hereth in Judah. Saul, meanwhile, scolded his men at Gibeah for not giving him info on David that he needed. And Doeg the Edomite, whom we heard about earlier, uh, Doeg the Edomite spoke up and he mentioned that he had seen David vis visiting the high priest Ahimelech. Saul summoned Ahimelech to question him about helping David, and Ahimelech reasoned that this wasn't the first time that he had prayed to God for David, and also that David was more loyal to Saul than anybody else. He's making an argument as to why Saul shouldn't feel threatened by David. He asked what he was supposed to do, but Saul ordered that Ahimelech and all the other priests be killed, and Saul's men refused to do this, refused to kill the priests. They're like, okay, we're getting into really sketchy territory even though israel as a nation isn't overly spiritually strong at this time the men nonetheless know when we get into the realm of killing priests uh god could could punish us uh so the guy who rises to the occasion is doeg the edomite the uh, chief shepherd that we heard about earlier he agreed to do it he killed 85 priests that day and he also killed everyone in the priestly town of nob one son of ahimelech named abiathar escaped and told David what had happened. And David told uh, Abiathar to stay with David and he would be protected. All right, uh, that is our summary for 1 Samuel 22. Mm -hmm. uh, any initial reactions to that? No, the, all the towns have terrible names. <laughs> Nob, Gad, Gath. Yeah, and so, right, and some of Doeg. them are, we don't exactly know how that to might pronounce be a person. them. Doeg is a person, but might as well be a town. Yeah, and some of them mean something specific. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, they definitely, we do not have names quite like these. So they're a little unfamiliar. And there are a lot of, especially one of the things that I've regretted as we've been going through and doing these studies, or maybe not regretted, but thought this would be easier, is for me to splice in maps to mm -hmm. show people exactly where we are in the kingdom. And so that would be extra work. And if a bunch of people ask for it, I suppose maybe I can do it. But it is helpful to see on a map where they are. Mm -hmm. Judah, in general, remember Judah is the southern Well, kingdom. they're using a computer, so they could just look at it. They a, also could Google, Google it. a map. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, in fact, you can, uh, not only that, you can Google, so David um, at Gibeah, mm -hmm. and it'll show you like where in the Bible he is in Gibeah and, um, you know, where the travels along the way. This has all been mapped out before, so we don't necessarily have to do it ourselves. Uh, here's the devotional thoughts for the day, though. Devotional thought number one is David's band of misfit toys. And here's what I mean. David's on the run. He attracts a crowd of 400 soldiers. And eventually, it's going to turn into 600, but it's 400 fighting men. And we're actually told who these, uh, who is compiling this group. It's, some of it is David's family, like his brothers. Uh, some of it are those who are simply disenchanted with Saul's unfaithful leadership and are sort of attracted to David's faithfulness to God. And some of it, we're told, are just people who are in deep debt, like financial debt to Saul, and therefore they're hoping for new leadership. 
And it's a combination of people like that. And when I was reading through that, the first thing it made me think of is like churches. Mm -hmm. Because churches oftentimes have an interesting dynamic of, there's oftentimes like extended families, like Mm -hmm. three three generations of families in that church. Yeah. Uh, And there's also some people who are just, uh, the the adult converts are disenchanted with the world. Mm -hmm. You know, like they realize, um, you know, this world doesn't offer, all it offers doesn't deliver on. I need something more, something bigger. And then the other group is, you know, there's a people who have hit rock bottom in life mm-hmm. and it's somebody who's had an addiction issue or their family or friends have disowned them or left them or whatever. But, you know, people who are, are hopeless and find hope in the gospel. Mm-hmm. And actually, so the group that's rallying around the most faithful individual here in David, to me, are the same people that rally around Christ in, in Christian churches. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's familial ties. <clears throat> sometimes it's disenchantment with the world. Sometimes it's people who have made uh, or hit rock bottom and are finding hope now. Um, so my question, th- these, by the way, are the future leaders of mm-hmm. uh, what Israel is going to be. Uh, but what do you think as far, in terms of who do you expect to find at the church or what do you think churches consist of? Well, growing up, there was a man who went to our church that we just called, I mean, he had a name and we knew it. But <laughs> me and my dad called him the man of a thousand tie-dyes because mm-hmm. every week he just wore a different tie-dyed shirt. I don't know if he made them, I don't know where he got him. Maybe he was rich that he owned a thousand tie-dye t-shirts. But. Maybe he was. But I feel like if you are in a church where everyone else in the church is kind of like you, and we've actually been part of churches like this before, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I think it does raise some questions as to like how effectively are you proclaiming the gospel because you should be attracting people who are in different financial circles in different uh, cultural circles than you because the gospel is the one thing that unites people so when you have a church that's very homogenous um it again sometimes it's just that's who lives in that area yeah um but yeah yeah, so not every like geographic location is equally diverse mm-hmm. or whatever. But the the basic point that you want people to be united by something other than the other factors of society and culture that that uh, bring them together. Mm-hmm. So if everybody in your church has the same politics, mm-hmm. if everybody in your church is the same age, if everybody in your church is the same ethnic background, if everybody here in your church is the same education and economic classes. If everyone's the same economic class, it's unfortunate because it's um, like one of the cool things about the church, I'm, it's not communal in any way, or it's not communal as a whole, but if there's someone who needs something, yeah, typically there are more affluent members in the church who want to be generous and give, give in the way they've seen Christ give to them. So if you were all at the same level, you'd, you're doing both parties a disservice. Yeah, well, I mean, James flat out says in his letter in the New Testament that he encourages those who have to share with those who have not. And so mm-hmm. he's assuming that in the same church, you're gonna have people who, who have and have not. Mm-hmm. And again, that means that something is uniting you bigger than cultural ties and superficial ties. And that greater thing is the gospel. Um, it's interesting that uh, so like church growth literature in the later portion of the 20th century when there were some essentially social scientists who are saying if you want to grow your church as fast as possible what they were encouraging was homogenous units mm-hmm. meaning just get a bunch of like-minded people who are already of the same uh, persuasion in the way they think and act and talk mm-hmm. and then just add the gospel to it mm-hmm. and you can grow your church as fast as possible um, it's it i think in many ways is actually true like mm-hmm. sociologically but it's not the way church is designed it, it, it robs the church of the beauty of what it was meant to be which is a unity of people who the only thing that truly unites them is the grace of jesus yeah um i think it's i mean i definitely know it's like our sinful nature to want to be around like intrinsically i want to be around people like me who have no kids understand what i mean with my like cultural vernacular like people with the same they already get your mentality yeah but when i'm around people that are different than me that's actually very enriching yeah. but sometimes it just makes you a little uncomfortable like that's the sinful part of it like i want to be as com- i guess i think if i had to summarize what sin is i'd say wanting to be as comfortable as possible all the time yeah self-centeredness i think yeah uh 
Yeah, it's totally true. It's easiest to be around people who are already like you, but the people, when you actually push into being around people of a different age bracket, mm -hmm. of a different uh, philosophy of life, of a different cultural heritage, it's, it makes you so much more well-rounded. And you develop an appreciation for those things that are different and maybe scary at first. But, um, you know, single people being with married couples or people yep. with kids being with people without kids mm -hmm. or younger people being with older people, you, you pick up how much you don't. It's a different angle of life. And for that matter, a different angle of the goodness of God's grace that you just gain an appreciation mm -hmm. uh, for for who God is as you gain an appreciation for who those people are. Uh, devotional thought number two then. Um, perfect arguments don't change hearts. <coughs> now, this is a... Not, I'm not attacking Christian apologetics because I love Christian apologetics. Um, in fact, I think that they're actually commanded in Scripture. 1 Peter 3.15 is kind of the famous passage that says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, assuming that you will be able to logically articulate why you believe what you believe. That's part of your Christian witness. That's a good thing. That said, we have to understand the limitations of Christian apologetics. And so, for instance, this is an, an, another example. Saul here summons the high priest Ahimelech, and he interrogates him essentially with an illegal trial for why he has previously helped David when David was on the run. And Ahimelech gives multiple arguments. Um, he says, one, David has been a faithful servant to the king. Number two, the entire nation totally respects David uh, based on his character. In other words, he's, he's popular and well-liked for who he is. Number three, David says, excuse me, Ahimelech says to Saul, David's your son-in-law. You should be better at a family. Number four, uh, David had held a high position even in Saul's household. So before he killed Goliath, David was nonetheless working in Saul's house. And Saul thought quite highly of him. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you, you've proven in the past that you like this guy. Why are you attacking him now? And number five, the great argument is, if David was really a threat to you, if David was ever going to try to kill you to take over the king, uh, the kingdom, don't you think he would have already done this? He had mm -hmm. plenty of opportunities to do that when he was working in your home, but he didn't do that, which means you shouldn't look at him as a threat. So, in other words, Ahimelech presents this airtight, perfect argument as to why Saul should not perceive David as a threat. Mm -hmm. Does it convince Saul? No. Because our emotions... Uh, what we love or what we hate is rarely simply based or even primarily based in logic. Mm -hmm. uh, Saul's convictions are entirely due to the pride that exists in his heart. In fact, uh, Ahimelech's not the first person to make this argument to Saul. Jonathan, Saul's son, made the exact same argument to Saul back in 1 Samuel 19. None of it convinced Saul because Saul doesn't hate David for logical reasons. Saul hates David because of pride. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing could be said of humans in general. Human beings don't simply disbelieve in God because of logic, mm -hmm. for logical reasons. Well, I think a lot of people who disbelieve or are skeptical think it's for logical reasons. What they don't understand, what the Bible actually says is, no, you actually disbelieve as a result of pride. And pride is what produces unbelief. Um, any, can you think of any other, so we often talk about Christian apologetics and how helpful it is. Can you think of other or potential drawbacks to Christian apologetics? In other words, apologetics is giving a defense for why you believe what you believe. Um, no, I do. I mean, I do think, yes, they're good. I've like been to apologetics groups and learned stuff like that. Um, like that's. The, pretty much the whole ministry of Answers in Genesis, which we big fans talk of, about yeah. a lot and support. Um, but I do also think there's something about... So if you had to stack apologetics against like someone's personal testimony, and I know we every Christian has a personal testimony of what God has done for them, but some people's... I don't want to say they're better than others, but yeah. some people's are like better than others. Yeah, different and story. And so there's at least two... I can specific two people in my life I can specifically think of where when you hear their testimony, you are almost blown away. The things that they'll say, like, God delivered me from that. Um, and I don't know, to me, I guess sometimes that's more powerful. Like someone you respect who 
yeah, someone you respect telling you about a personal experience that they've had and how much it changed their life, I think can be very powerful. So that's a good argument. I was thinking about, I was thinking a little bit differently, but you're saying a Christian apologet Christian apologetics is not only the way to persuade somebody about the goodness of the gospel. In other words, not just using a logical argument, but using a, like a beautiful argument. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, here's what God has accomplished through this person's life and, and, his, and so forth. Um, another thing I thought about was, the so like for instance this weekend i preached on marriage mm -hmm. and i actually specifically said in the sermon i have all sorts of information that i think is is actually really good research regarding uh gender differences and how god on the basis of sex wires men and different women differently i think there's a lot of research that actually supports that um, and I said, and I'm not going to share any of it with the congregation. And I told him that. And I said, the reason for that is I can give you a good logical argument, but then it becomes an issue of the logical argument I have versus the logical argument that you have. Mm -hmm. I don't want us to ultimately submit to God's design for marriage because of good logical arguments. I want us to submit to God's design for marriage because God said it. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a danger in putting too much uh, credence in logical arguments. So the way I generally try to use Christian apologetics is when somebody else says, no, I can't believe in God because blank, logical argument. What I will do then is I'll say, no, here's a counter. So I get your logical argument. Here's my counter logical argument. And I don't know why your argument is more logical than mine. Mm -hmm. So maybe belief is not simply a matter of logic. And so it's almost like defensive against somebody else's logical defense. And then I share with them what I hope is a more beautiful truth of the gospel and let the Holy Spirit take it from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Devotional thought number three then. Um, God's sovereignty over the priesthood. So... Uh, maybe kind of an obscure point here and, and a little bit difficult to uh, piece together at first. But we have this guy named Doeg the Edomite, who we said is the chief shepherd of the king. And he's the one who was um, there when David, remember when he asked the high priest Ahimelech for the showbread mm -hmm. and all that whole stuff? Okay, well, Doeg the Edomite was there. He reports it back to the king, uh, King Saul at this time. Uh, he rises to this whole occasion when Saul's looking for somebody to kill uh, Ahimelech and all that. And Doeg, okay, so he not only kills Ahimelech, he kills the 85 priests and he kills the entire priestly town of Nob. Um, very clearly, the whole trial here is illegal. It's completely wicked. It's unjust. And yet, interestingly enough, it is the fulfillment of a former prophecy that God had given to Eli back at the beginning of the book. Remember Eli and his sons? Eli was the one who he took extra fattened offerings and his mm -hmm. sons were having sex with the women at the and tent Eli of meeting. Eli was the priest. Eli was the high priest. Mm -hmm. And Eli very clearly was not a good father. And God says, I'm done with you guys. He's the one that raised Samuel. Uh, he raised, yes, Samuel from early on, even though his, his wicked sons were named Hophni and Phinehas. Uh -huh. But yes, he was a father figure to Samuel uh, at the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And so, but God at that point had said, okay, Eli, because of your family's wickedness, mm -hmm. I'm taking the priestly line. I said it was going to exist for forever. Nope. Now I'm taking the priestly line away from him. Although he did not do that immediately. We're starting to see the fulfillment of it right here. Um, again, it was in 1 Kings 2. Uh, now, I'm sorry, when we get to 1 Kings 2, so this is in 1 Samuel 2 that we heard about Eli's wickedness. But when you eventually get to 1 Kings 2, David removes this guy, Abiathar, who is the last from Eli's line. So remember, Ahimelech has a son that escapes, becomes mm -hmm. a priest for David. His name is Abiathar. When we get to 1 Kings chapter 2, David is going to remove Abiathar, who's the last from Eli's line, from the priesthood. And at that point, he starts off a new line of priests through the family of Zadok. And, and here's my point. I want to make like a sovereignty point in this. Um, God doesn't cause sin. God doesn't cause unfaithfulness. And yet he can see it ahead of time and he arranges it in such a way that he can use it to carry out his plans. Mm -hmm. And so an example of this would be, for instance, like Judas' betrayal. Mm -hmm. God did not cause Judas to betray Jesus, 
But he saw that it was going to happen, and he actually used Judas's sin as a way to bring salvation into the world through the crucifixion of Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's Judas's sin that was arranged by God to occasion uh, the payment of our sins on the cross. And God is constantly doing that. He's doing it here. He, he told, he didn't cause Eli's family's wickedness. He didn't whatever, but he said, I'm going to use this throughout history uh, to this is eventually what is going to happen. So my, again, point being that God is, uh, he prophesied this is going to happen. This is exactly what is now happening. And um, it's, it's once again, you're not going to outrun God on these types of things. He's going to bring his purposes about in due time. Okay. Any final thoughts on any of this? Mm -mm. All right, should we close with the prayer then? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thanks for our time today in your word. Thank you for, um, again, we, we, as we see David on the run, as we see David in exile, we're reminded that our time here on earth is temporary. Um, we're going to see how David remains faithful even when his enemy, enemies in life are treating him so poorly. Uh, Lord, please let that empower us uh, to recognize that um, we can remain faithful by your power, not on our own, but by your power, we can remain faithful even when other people try to mistreat us. Uh, we know that Jesus has been unwaveringly and unconditionally loving and faithful to us uh, by that same grace, saved by that grace, empowered by that grace. Move us to be really faithful, really respectful, really kind and generous, even to people who don't treat us all that well. And may it glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for studying with us. We're going to see you next time uh, as we combine another two chapters, chapter 23 and 24 of 1 Samuel.